Welcome back to uh, the sequel, Describing Data Part 2. And forget what you've heard about sequels and how they match up to the original. We're going to go for a full continuum here of hopefully goodness. So in this section, we're going to finish our treatise on describing data, and we're going to delve into exploring something called the normal distribution, which will actually be the basis for a lot of what we do in the rest of the term. And it's not going to seem obvious as to why at first, but we'll get you there, and we'll create a mystique that will have you craving more. So we're going to talk about the normal distribution, talk about means, variability, and the normal distribution, talk about calculating something called normal scores and their relevance to a normal distribution. And then we'll talk about means variability and these Z or normal scores for non-normal distributions. So let's get started with the normal distribution. Many of you probably don't need an introduction to the normal distribution, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, we'll do it here. It's what we call a theoretical probability distribution, something at the population level for some population that describes the distribution of values in this theoretical population that is perfectly symmetric about its mean, which is also equal to its median, which is a property of symmetry, as you may remember, and its mode, and has a bell-like shape. It's also sometimes called the Gaussian distribution in honor of its inventor, Carl Friedrich Gauss, and here's a picture of the man himself. Something very interesting about the normal distribution, you only need two pieces of information to perfectly describe any normal distribution. You need to know its mean and its standard deviation. Normal distributions are uniquely defined by these two quantities, mu and sigma, for the population that they theoretically describe. And there are literally an infinite number of possible normal curves for every possible combination of mu and sigma. So here you see three different curves with different centers and different spreads. I couldn't fit an infinite number on the slide, but you get the point. So here we have three curves again, one whose mean is negative two, another whose mean is zero, another whose mean is one, different spread. These curves are actually defined by a rather complicated function. The function that defines the normal curve for a given mu and sigma looks like this, and it's very sexy mathematically, involves almost every symbol you'd ever want. So it's a great thing to get on a t-shirt if you're a nerd like me, but otherwise you can ignore this. I just want to show you mathematically why mu and sigma are all we need to describe this. The other symbols in this formula, pi and an e, represent two constants, pi is the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its radius, 3.14, etc. Somebody in Maryland actually memorized a record number of digits of pi. So there's a little fact for you. And then E is the natural constant, which is roughly equal to 2.7 something. And basically, you can plug in for all possible values that are taken or covered by this normal curve represented by x's. You can plug in that x, and the only thing that this formula then depends on is the value of mu and sigma. If you change that, you change this formula. So any single curve evaluated at all possible values the curve takes on, the x's, through this formula and plotted in two dimensions would give you that nice bell shape. That's just an FYI. When we look at this curve described by that function, areas under the normal curve represent the proportion of total values described by the curve that fall in that range. So in this curve, for example, this shows the plot of a normal distribution whose mean is 0, whose standard deviation is 1, and the shaded area represents the proportion of values or observations between 0.5 and 2 for values that follow a normal distribution with mu of 0 and sigma of 1. So if the distribution of values of a population were characterized or followed a normal distribution centered at zero with spread of one, roughly 29% of the individual values in that population would fall between 0.5 and 2. Where did the 29% come from? Well, it came from a table, and we'll describe how to use those tables and ultimately the computer in the next section to get such areas. Now, again, the normal distribution is a theoretical distribution. No real sample data will ever truly be normally distributed. In fact, no real population will have a true normal distribution. A lot of things approximated well by a normal distribution at the sample and population level. But this is a theoretical distribution. In fact, just to give you an example, the tails of the normal curve are infinite. 
for any normal curve, the population that it describes, technically speaking, has values everywhere on the number line. You can see that, for example, this normal curve we looked at before with mean zero and spread one, that most, almost all the values described by this curve fall between negative three and three. But theoretically, it would be possible to have observations all the way negative infinity and positive infinity in a population whose true distribution of population values were described by this. So no real data is truly normally distributed at the population level even. But many times it's a good approximation or the data approximates a normal curve and we can use some nice properties of the normal curve to make statements, which we'll get into in the next few sections. So for example, some data does approximate a normal curve pretty well. Here's a histogram of the blood pressure of the 113 men we looked at before with a normal curve superimposed. And the normal curve here has the same mean and same standard deviation as the sample of 113 men. And you can see, well, it's not a perfect fit, but it wouldn't be too far-fetched to say that that sample data displays in line with something that's similar to a normal distribution. And we might say, well, it, it's only a sample from a larger process, and it's not impossible, given this matchup, to think that the process that, or population distribution of all blood pressures is very similar to a normal curve. Other data does not approximate a normal distribution. Here is a histogram of a hospital length of stay data, again, that we looked at before, of a 1,000 patients with the normal curve superimposed. And this normal curve has the same mean and standard deviation as the sample of 1,000 patients, 5.1 days and 6.4 respectively. So you can see here that this normal curve, as we, this normal curve symmetric and bell-shaped, and superimposing a normal curve, we only get about a little more than half of it because this data in the sample is not well approximated by a normal curve, which suggests that the distribution length of stay values at the population level would also not be well approximated by a normal curve. So that's just a little briefing on the properties of a normal curve. We're going to get into more of the nitty-gritty in the next section and try and justify why we're spending so much time looking at this as we move along.